Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 20th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week we've got a lot to cover. So I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement of their, uh, I can't say nutritious, <laughs> but I can say delicious drink. But PepsiCo, if you're out there, let me know. Red Bull said I was too fat. I gave it a shot. And I just missed my trash can. Oh, well. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm not an athlete. All right, as a disclaimer, we know how this works. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book. You like the book. Throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon.com. And the reason I beg for reviews, other than the obvious reason, egotistical purposes, and to um, just to have good reviews out there, is because there are some malignant people who review the reviews, and a good review helps to balance that out, meaning that uh, a good review is someone who actually read the book and liked the book. You don't have to, you don't have to be sappy and glowing. There's a few reviews out there that are a little... Um, Oh, I don't know, constructive criticism type. One said it's too much work, which I agree with. But um, anyway, but throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon.com. All right, enough of that. Well, what are we going to talk about? Well, today I want to tell you everything that you wanted to know about volatility swings but were afraid to ask. And I want to continue along the theme simply because I got an email from uh, the gentleman who was doing some um, value investing, for lack of a better word. I want to continue along those lines with um, options that never expire, and that's going to make a little more sense in just a few minutes. Anything you want me to cover, uh, start thinking about it now. If I can work it in, I'll be happy to do that. But if not, it'll be fodder for next week's show. Um, one thing, doing the slides, if you don't mind, keep the questions uh, on the slides. And then once we start, um, once we're through with the slides, feel free to start opening up uh, new topics. And then uh, once we get to the charts, I'll open it up for stocks. But once you start punching in stocks, like your stock picks, just punch in one stock at a time and hit carriage return. You can ask about 10 or 20 or 30 stocks. we we'll just do it one line at a time. So I can uh, talk about the stock and then move on okay uh, let me get fix my screen here if I can get back to my uh, just I gotta get the Q and let me get the Q&A back up one second I don't know where it went Oh, here we go. Reversion to the mean. Okay. All right, so volatility waxes and wanes. And there's a couple of different ways of thinking about how this happens. Uh, one way is, uh, a good way is with um, a compression of a spring. You've got a spring, and if that spring gets stretched into one direction like this, it tends to bounce back in the opposite direction. And then conversely, if that spring gets compressed like this, it tends to bounce back in the opposite direction. So usually after a high volatility, let's make this a high volatility situation, it, the market actually ends up in a lower volatility situation. And after a lower volatility situation, it snaps back to higher volatility. Now, Another way of looking at it is the swinging of a pendulum. And let's say this is high over here and this is low. Now, one reason I like the pendulum example is that volatility tends to overshoot when it reverts back to the mean. So John's asking about reversion to the mean. Yeah, that's what we talk about today. So when volatility gets really low, let's say volatility is way down here, it tends to overshoot to the upside. It doesn't come back to normal, but as a general statement, it tends to overshoot. Now, keep in mind 
that everything we're going to talk about today is as a general statement. It doesn't always pan out exactly as I'm going to show you, but these are some general statements and some observations that I've made over the years through a lot of empirical research and actually uh, a small bit of mechanical testing too. So think about it as that spring being compressed, getting ready to expand back when it gets compressed. And then think about it also as that pendulum swinging. But if the pendulum doesn't swing back to the middle, which someone uh, John's asking about reversions to the mean, that would be reversion to the mean. The average would be the middle of the pendulum. It doesn't swing back to the middle. It swings usually towards the high side. And then from the high side, vice versa. It's kind of a strange anomaly that you have these super volatile markets and all of a sudden everything just quiets down, which I find kind of uh, kind of interesting and sort of fascinating. That you would think that once a market gets really volatile, it would continue to be volatile, but strangely enough, it begins to calm down. Now, one of the nuances of volatility is that markets tend to bottom on high volatility, and they tend to top on low volatility, and that's a general statement, okay? And I don't want to make that a blanket statement. The reason because there's somebody was pointing out that I'm not going to point out uh, what organization or what test, but there was a, a technical analyst test to be a technical analyst, and it said something about uh, the low volatility means that a market is topped. And no, that's not necessarily true. But as a general statement, markets do tend to top on a low volatility situation or after a low volatility situation, you could, you could have a market top. But one doesn't necessarily guarantee the other. And just uh, conversely, markets do tend to bottom on high volatility, but that's not always the case. The market might go down and then base for a while. But it's kind of interesting. And, and don't get too caught up in this, but I just want to show you this is the – if you take the six-day volatility reading, six-day HV, and I'll give you this formula if you want, and I, I wrote it myself, but you can have it. Actually, I wrote the six one six fifty uh, formula, but uh, somebody else gave me the the original formula that I, that I worked from, and you divide it by the fifty-day HV. So what we're looking for is a ratio of the short-term volatility to the longer-term volatility ratio. Now you probably don't hear me talk about volatility that much. I was really into volatility in the late 90s. Um, in fact, I think it was 1998, I actually wrote an article about volatility in stocks and commodities magazine. So I was really into it back then. I was inspired by uh, Larry Connor's work. And then I think Larry was inspired by Natenberg's work. Uh, and that's where I think Larry got the historical volatility from. And this is where I got the historical, I got the historical volatility from Larry. But I also did read uh, Natenberg, uh, Natenberg's uh work too. I should have pulled the book out before I got started, but it's here somewhere. Nadenberg, uh, Option Volatility and Pricing Models was the book where he talked a lot about um, volatility, if you want to get into that. But just take my word for it. You don't have to get too deeply into it, but just notice that volatility does tend to spike and get really high when the market begins to bottom out. Now, if you think about it, what's happening is that you have a bit of a panic. They slide faster than they glide. You have a bit of a panic. People sell first and they ask questions later. In fact, as technical analysts, that's what we should do. Okay, But you could notice that, now I'm not going to come out here and, and preach a system or teach a system, but notice that we do have some pretty significant peaks that correspond with peaks in the volatility. But rest assured that it won't always happen because, let's say right here, you had a pretty serious sell-off, volatility peaked out, and then the market reversed. Well, there's no guarantee that this market will keep on dropping, but it is kind of interesting to pay attention to what's going on with the volatility. The last little bottom we had, we had a little bow tie in here. We sold off extremely hard. Well, notice that volatility peaked once again, right as that market sold off hard and had a bit of that reversal day, or reversal days, I should say, in here. And then volatility began to drop. Now, Volatility has reached a bit of an extremely low level because it was very high here, okay? And that pendulum has swung now from high. This is high over here. 
all the way back to low, okay? And not only did it go low, it went to extremely low levels. So we are due for a large move soon. Now, volatility, and I've got a nice little, little uh, chart we're going to go over with all this in just one second. So don't worry if you miss something. But volatility does not predict price. There are some nuances like, yes, a market tends to bottom on high volatility, and these little peaks just line up perfectly. Okay, study that on your own. And it's really cool, but it's not always going to happen like that. There's no guarantee, right? But it, it does look pretty cool based on what you're seeing, okay? And then here you can see another little peak in volatility before it dropped off. But now that it's so extreme to the downside, that pendulum has swung so far the other way, we're due for a large move in the market. Now, volatility, at least the way I measure it with historical volatility, measures the closing prices, okay? So I've just kind of highlighted the closing prices in here. And you can see up until this little blip we had on Wednesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, those closes were pretty tight. And so far, since then, the closes are pretty tight too. So we only had this tiny little blip up in volatility. I would not call that the expansion in volatility. As I wrote in a column this morning, you know, it's not, it's, they're not going to make it easy for us. It was a big obvious move higher and not just a small move higher. Then the expansion in volatility, we could easily say that it has begun. Now, one thing you need to watch for, when volatility does compress, and I don't know if we have any good examples uh, in the chart itself, but when the volatility does get very compressed, sometimes your first move out of that low volatility situation is a false one. In fact, if let's say you had a, I've actually tested this, and I was going to write about it years ago, but the, the whole deal sort of fell through. That's a, that's a story. Buy me a beer one night. We'll talk about what happened there. But um, I talked about, or I was going to write about the fact that when volatility gets extremely low, if you wait for a market to have its first move out of that volatility situation, and that volatility begins to expand, that first move could often be a false one. So you would look to buy, let's say this move was down, you would look to buy up here, okay? Now let's say this first move was higher, then you would look to sell short right here with it, when that market comes in. Now I say when that market comes in, keep in mind, every now and then you get a breakout, and what happens, it keeps on breaking out. And this is why, this is why, I'm sorry, I was trying to multiprocess, I was trying to answer a question at the same time. Um, but this is why I think the system tests out so well is because a lot of your would have been losing trades, okay, are avoided. Because let's say this market breaks out, it keeps on going. Well, that says you should short it right here. But if it keeps on going, there's no trade, okay. So if you have a system that misses a lot of losing trades or avoids a lot of losing trades, then all that's left is the winners, obviously, or mostly winners, I should say. And you might just have a viable system on your hands. Now, I don't always trade this directly because it's a very short-term type of system. Um, Back when I did the testing, the 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 your the initial profitable move was pretty high percentage, but it wasn't like a big move longer term, and that's what we're playing for. But nevertheless, you can get some very short term moves over a short period of time, okay, by looking for that volatility to fake out in one direction, and that's what I'm talking about. There. So where does this leave us? Well, P's are way down here. So we had a tiny bit expansion to the upside, but then it came right back in. And again, if we just kind of connect all the dots, you can see the volatility has really shrunk it in here. Okay. But I rarely plot this. I only plot it in cases like now when I think it's worth showing. Okay. I just tend to eyeball the markets and I say, okay, well, I could see, 
Oops. I can see that the volatility has waned. And I don't actually need to put that indicator on the chart. But the beauty of the indicator is it does it does show you what's actually happening empirically, okay? So let me just draw that out one more time up for my um because we did lose the uh, feed, obviously. But you can see the volatility began to compress. Now, one thing I don't like is I don't, not to get too sidetracked in the price, I don't like these wedging action in here. I like to see the market do this and then do this and not this and then this, okay? So this is bad. This is good, but this is bad. Now, what I was hoping for, and it still might not be too late, it was, I, was, I was hoping for a bit of a knockout move like this in the S&P 500, something obvious, almost that big maybe, and then see the market turn around and go right back up. And then that way you would have gotten one of these volatility fake outs, which is a pretty cool thing. And I prefer to see them in the direction of the overall trend. So it's kind of a neat thing when it comes to volatility. Volatility is pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool stuff, and I, I kind of beat it to death years ago before I became really just came back, I shouldn't say um, started, but came back to price and pretty much only price, but there are some cool nuances about volatility. Again, as a general statement, a market can top on low volatility, and a market can usually bottom on high volatility, but that does not mean that because volatility is low, it's going to top, or because it's high, it's going to bottom. Low could always become lower. High could always become higher. So that kind of dovetails into our next statement, or a corollary. Volatility does not predict price. So you can't use that as a blanket statement. You can't put on a technical analysis test that low volatility means the market has topped, or high volatility means the market has bottom and when you're if you're a little bit newer to technical analysis some of these things might sound you talk, sound like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth but keep in mind that it's more of an art than a science and then uh, a book I'm working on is the lost art of stock selection because I think it is a lost art and the I own a website the art of the charts and that's right now it's just temporary storage for my service people for my service log on uh, to keep that separate from DaveLander.com. Uh, but I do think it's an art, and, and there seems to be some actually have a debate over this, which I was unaware of. I thought everybody thought it was an art, kind of like, um, you know, everybody knows that. <laughs> um, so it is an art, but there are some observations you could make, and such observations can help you out. So if you see a market absolutely imploding and you got the spike low and, and you can cut the fear with a knife and the volatility is at an extreme level that you haven't seen in many, many, many years, you might just be close to a bottom, okay? So there are some general things, but just never forget that volatility does not necessarily predict the direction, okay? Now that volatility is going to swing from high to low and low to high and back and forth again, but that's not necessarily going to give you a market direction. Um, one thing that's kind of cool is that the volatility does tend to overshoot itself. So when you get that extremely low situation like we have right now, we know that we are due for a larger than normal move, not just a reversion to the mean, but an overshot of that mean. Again, visualize that pendulum swinging right back. Keep in mind that when you have that low volatility situation, Traders don't tend to agree for long, and if they do start agreeing for a little while, some new information flows into the market, and it kind of changes things up quickly. And if you think about that, you've got a lot of, let's say you've got a little tight base in here, and everybody's pretty much in agreement on price, and it's kind of keeping it compressed within the little base. Your volatility just drops like a stone down like this. Well, as soon as some new information flows into that, that market, and it can be price information too. Let's say that uh, a large hedge fund has to be uh, has to dump some shares out on the market or whatever. So as soon as that information 
flows into the market, you have a disequilibrium, and then all these players begin jockeying for position. Either they, they look to bail out or they're, they're trying to hang on and figure it all out, and then that causes volatility to overshoot itself. Okay. Now, conversely, what's kind of interesting is, and it never ceases to amaze me, is that you have, like sometimes you have a huge, huge update in the market, look like that, the next day you have a, a, like a little tick, like a shoulder shrug. So sometimes you have the corn after the storm. So it's like you have a huge spike in volatility, and all of a sudden everything quiets way down for a while. So just know that it swings back and forth. And then once again, just remember when you get that low volatility situation, remember that the first move could also be a fast, uh, a false one. Okay. I am of the view that stock selection is the most important element of all. I agree. I think you're, that's uh, John saying that. I agree, and I think that's sort of the missing piece that I kind of, you know, I wrote these books over the past 15 years, and, and that's why I'm writing the last book. I say it's the last book, but it, I think it will be. <laughs> who knows? It, it's funny. Everybody in this business who writes a book says this is going to be my last book because it's a tremendous amount of trouble. Um, but that is the missing piece, and that's why I did the course on that, and that's why we spent 14 hours on picking stocks. I think that's the missing piece. I think a, a good offense is your best defense. If you're picking the best stocks to begin with, you're going to have less losing trades and more winning trades, and that's going to make it easier to follow your plan and follow the methodology. So absolutely, John, I agree with you 100%. Okay. All right, uh, John, you wanted me to cover reversion to the mean. Did we get that? Here's the easiest way to remember reversion to the mean. If you know someone who's normally mean and they're nice to you for a few days, they're going to revert back to being mean. That's that's almost guaranteed. Okay. We'll get to that question, John, as soon as we get done with this. Okay, options that never expire. You might be thinking, what the heck is that? Well, a stock at very low levels, okay, can only go to zero. If you buy an option, let's say you buy an option for a dollar, what's the most you can lose on an option? A dollar, okay? So let's say you buy a stock at a dollar. What's the most you can lose on that stock? A dollar, okay? Now, you could get a little philosophical and say, okay, if I buy an option on something, it's going to have a decay issue because that option is going to expire. So sometimes between now and expiration, if this stock doesn't move by a set amount, then that option is going to expire worthless. It's going to decay between now and then. And there's actually complex pricing models that that um, that try to predict or, or show how this decay will work. And all you have to do is trade options for a while, and you'll learn really quick. And you'll learn that there's a nonlinear decay as that option approaches expiration. It begins decaying very, very fast. Okay. Now, I don't want to digress too far and, and show how little I know about options. I actually know a little bit about options because I was involved with a hedge fund that just traded options for 14 years. So I picked up a little bit through osmosis. So I do know a little bit about it, but it opens up a can of worms whenever we get into options because different people are going to believe different things. So I don't want to digress and get too far into the option uh, analysis. But do know that options have a decay. You buy an option, it's good for a certain amount of time, and then the option expires. And that goes for options in life, too. If you bought an option, on a, uh, if you had an option to buy a house or something, that option has a limited period of time and has a contract. Okay. But let's say you buy a $1 stock. Well, it's like buying an option that never expires. The most you can lose is one dollar on that position. Well, another way of looking at it too, though, is you still could lose a hundred percent of whatever you put up. So that's one way to think about it too, and never forget that. Okay. But let's say that a stock is at very low, low levels. So you're like, okay, I think I want to buy a thousand shares of the stock for a dollar. It's just a thousand dollars. Okay. Well, if you know that the company will never go out of business, and someday, not only will they never go out of business, but someday they will get their act together and not only not go out of business, not only not go out of business, 
can say that. Uh, but in addition, not only go bankrupt, not, not go bankrupt, but in addition to that, they get their act together and they will begin to rally, okay? So how do you know a stock will never go out of business? You don't. And if you do, and my best, what was her name? Margie? 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 Margie O'Hulahan? Uh, Hannigan? What was her name? From Caddyshack. No, you don't, Danny. <laughs> so you don't know that, okay? So that's a that's a big if, and that's a big caveat. Um, we talked about in-use value. In fact, I think I've got a slide in here somewhere on that. Here we go. Value investing only works with something that has in-use value. Now, I looked up in-use, uh, and on Google, it's a noun. It's just the application of function for which something is designed or for which it is ultimately used. It's in-use, and I use the example of toilet paper, and kind of makes a pun there, in-use. Uh, but if you had a chance to buy a 1,000 rolls of toilet paper at five cents each, provided it wasn't sandpaper toilet paper. Let's say it's nice, fluffy, good toilet paper, uh, unused, of course. <laughs> then that might be a pretty good deal. I haven't priced toilet paper lately, but I know it's more than five cents. So you could, you know you could at least sell it for some sort of value that's probably more than five cents. Or let's say if there was a, a glut of toilet paper for the next few years, well, now you've got, a thousand rolls of toilet paper that you could eventually use up. It has some use. It has some in use to you. It has some value at least to you. And it also has value to other people. And that's why in a commodity market, if commodities get really cheap, I'm not going to say rush out and be a value investor in commodities because they could always get cheaper. But if they did get really cheap, um, there might be a, a, an argument for picking up some commodities at a very low level. Now, of course, I guess the problem would be you'd have a delivery problem and, and there's all kind of other issues involved with that. But as a general statement, if you are going to bottom fish, then bottom fish more in commodities, which actually do have an end use as opposed to stocks, which do not. Okay. Uh, the market can be a really bad teacher. I'm going to show you... Um, the example that someone pointed out the stocks last week and they actually bought a stock and they made a hundred percent on the stock that they bought last week. Well the problem with that is define low. Okay? They bought a stock because it was low, but who's to say that it can't go lower? We'll take a look at that in the chart uh in just one second. Okay. But what about for S and G's? Well, it's not by way of the highway. So if you want to do something for S and G's, then by all means, knock yourself out. If you want to buy $1,000 worth of a stock at $1 because you think this company will never go out of business, and, and $1,000 is not going to bankrupt you or is it a significant part of your lifestyle, if, it's, you know, if you make much more than that in a week, then knock yourself out if that's what you want to do. I'm just saying as a general statement, it's not a good way to invest. Now, I don't know, maybe if we have a the mother of all bear markets where you have, uh, but see, even this is the bad example. But let's say GM's trading at a dollar a share and Walmart's a dollar a share and all these major, major companies are a dollar a share and you don't think they can go out of business, then eh, maybe you could bottom fish a little bit. But this is not how we earn our living as technicians because low can always become lower. And the gentleman... I was speaking of, he happened to buy, let's see, somewhere somewhere around here he bought this stock, and he got a double almost overnight or within, a, within about a week. And now you can see the stock has already begun to implode back down, losing just yesterday, it lost 26% of its value. The question is, what is low, though? Because it looked like it was pretty low right here at 250, okay? And that was... I'm guessing all-time lows for this stock. And then it looked really low here, okay? And then so you lose about 75% of your investment had you bought it here because it was low. And then you'd still lose over half of your investment because you bought it here because it's low. Now, uh, he did get lucky and catch the bottom. And, you know, kudos to him for doing that. And if that's 
something that you are that you do, then go for it. But from where I sit, if something is low, okay, and if something is in a downtrend, there's a reason for that. And as a trend follower, I believe that in general that trend is going to continue. So try to catch a bottom is a loser's game. Low price stock and Caddyshack speak. The floater in the pool. <laughs> Okay, uh, John has a question here. Uh, any questions on volatility uh, as far as the, the waxing and the waning, the expansion, contraction, the overshooting of the, the pendulum swing? Any, any questions on buying options that never expire? Hopefully I made a case for not doing that because more often than not you will lose money doing that. Okay, all right. We've got a question here. I'm curious if you treat overhead supply commodity related stocks differently from differently than, for example, a biotech stock. Uh, the quick answer on that is no. And the reason is supply and demand is supply and demand. Okay? So if you have a stock that has overhead supply here and then that market drops and then you got a nice little setup right here nice little bow tie first thrust cup and handle reversal gap strategy um, whatever the problem is you know that your gains are likely limited to this much here from the entry up to the overhead supply. So this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter whether this is a company that makes widgets, a company that uh, mines for gold, a company that does um, coffee roasting, or whatever. I don't worry too much about what the company does, but if I see in the charts that it has overhead supply, then it has overhead supply, and I know that my gains may be limited by that overhead supply. So the quick answer is no. Now, with the commodity-related issue, I will sometimes make some exceptions on some things. Let's say it's rallying off of lows, and then it gaps down a little bit, okay? It makes like a little pullback or like a bow tie down here. Let's say this is a gold stock, okay? And we got a nice little textbook, Dave Landry bow tie. Got a tiny little gap against the trend. I might go ahead and take this trade anyway, even though it's got this gap against the trend, because... Sometimes a jump in a commodity can cause a jump in the stock. So maybe that commodity jumped down overnight and the stock got whacked a little bit just because of that. So uh, commodity-related stocks can have that efficiency to them where they get correlated to the underlying commodity, and efficient markets do tend to chop around a little bit more. So I know the nature of the beast going in, if I'm trading a gold stock or a silver stock or whatever, it's going to be at the mercy to some extent of the underlying, to some extent being a key word, key phrase in that sentence. And I know it can bounce around a little bit, okay? So I will be slightly more lenient, whereas if this was just a normal issue and I see a gap against the trend, especially because if it's just a developing trend like this, uh, or an emerging trend, then uh, I'm a little bit more concerned about it, okay? So the answer, quick answer to that is no, overhead supply is overhead supply. But I might be a little bit more lenient as a general statement in a commodity-related stock as opposed to a regular stock. You'll notice that we're along UEC, and it's kind of all over the place. It's kind of a crazy stock. Well, uranium is just a crazy rare earth metal that um, just bounces around like, like nuts, okay? And so if it were, if I was trying to look at a, just a normal stock or whatever, I wouldn't be as excited about it, and I might have actually passed, whereas UEC set up as a first thrust, and I'm like, oh, okay, I know uranium's kind of crazy. It could be all over the place. So I took the trade, okay? Hi, Dave. I'm a grateful attendee of your superior. Wow, superior webinars. Checks in the mail. I guess i got to send it all the way to Vienna, huh? Superior webinars. I look forward to your next show today. Thank you. Some days ago, Jillian showed up on my watch list as a short candidate, according to your methodology. 
We've got an all-time high, check, first thrust, check, and a bow tie, and an upside pullback. What are your thoughts on this, especially since Jillian is part of IBB, the biotech ETF, which is still relatively strong? Would appreciate if you could discuss Jillian the webinar later today. Regards from Vienna, Igor. Okay. Um, let's take a look at Jillian. Okay. So all-time highs, yeah. If you're going to trade a trend transition, you want it to be off all-time highs. He said a bow tie, a first thrust, that's your thrust down, and then you had a little bit of a pullback. Okay, so all the signs are there. The only thing I don't like is uh, I don't like this little trading in here. So it could find a little support in here, but as a general statement, it's a pretty good looking setup. It has gotten a little wide and loose as of late, and I don't like this little spike low. Ideally, you kind of want to see a stock kind of like up here like this. And then set up and then have nothing. Like here's your entry. Go to your left and not have anything, have nothing or not have anything uh, below where you go to short. So uh, that's got to be a little concerned in the fact that it's a little wide and loose. Now I do tend to look for perfection more often than not. Okay. Yeah, John, in the UEC, I think it could possibly overcome the resistance just because the uranium is so volatile. So I guess, not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but a case like UEC, which we'll take a look at when we get to the charts, um, I saw the overhead resistance, but I think it could take it out. If you take a look at URA, is that the uh, ETF? The, the overhead resistance is a little bit more defined. Although the pattern looks better, the overhead resistance is more defined, so I'd be a little more concerned about the overall... ETF, and I'd rather something like uh, UEC. We'll flesh that out in just one second. So uh, as far as um, Igor is concerned, I like I like what you're seeing. I like the pattern. A little wide and loose. You do have the spike down. Now, as you did point out, we do have some strength in the underlying sector, or at least the stack just kind of hanging in there. You can see this is the IBB, and you can see the IBB kind of took off, and now it's kind of consolidating at these fairly high levels. So remember, when you do take a trade, let's say the sector looks like this and your stock looks like this within the sector. Well, this might be a canary in the coal mine type of trade, and this thing might implode, and then when the sector implodes with it, or if the sector implodes with it, you caught the mother of all trades that you're in pretty early. But just keep in mind that a lot of times you're still fighting that longer-term trade in the underlying sector. Now, the only other thing that I kind of thought about with the Jillian is that getting back to the positives. Again, if we can get, get rid of this trading here, I'd feel a lot better about it because you 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 have all this trading here above it, and as it begins to drop, then this overhead supply could possibly can any uh, short covering rallies. But the other thing that's kind of interesting is if you plot your monthly or your weekly or whatever you want to plot longer term on Gilead, You'll see that we're at all-time highs, and those this stock was much, 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 much lower many, many, many years ago. So it could be priced for perfection. Now, I get a lot of questions when I say that. Dave, what do you mean, price for perfection? Well, price for perfection means that you heard, if you if you trade, of course. If you're not a non-trader, you probably never heard of it. But if you trade, you know what Jillian is, okay? You know it's the biggest or one of the biggest if not the biggest biotechs out there. Didn't they buy up a bunch of other biotech companies? So they're no longer trading like a little biotech. A little biotech with the promise of the future, going to solve uh, uh, some sort of problem, cure Ebola or whatever. Those could shoot up 100, 200, 300% overnight or over a period of days. Whereas Gilead is a more established company, and they've been around for a while, and they actually have real products that are actually, it's, it's no longer the promise of the future. The future is here. But with that comes valuations, and uh, I wonder how many, anybody ought to find out how many analysts following a stock? I bet there's a 1,000 analysts. And I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not. But I'd be willing to bet there's probably a thousand analysts that are following Jillian. I, I don't think that's an understatement. I, I don't know. Anyone know how to find it out? Uh, Google it or let me know. So once you've got that many people following them, once you have real earnings, and once you can project earnings on products and all, 
I'm not saying use fundamentals, but I'm saying that fundamentals tend to factor in to the price a little bit and tend to kind of contain the price and make that market more efficient. Now, when it comes to shorting, that can actually be a good thing. If you look at my website, the Go Go Nomo strategy, we're looking to short more efficient type of stocks. And also, if you are going to short a biotech, don't go out and short some little um, biotech that's out there that's a little small company because overnight they'll get FDA approval on something or they'll put out a press release that says, hey, I think we got Ebola cured, whether they have it cured or not. And the stock will jump up 200% overnight and you're going to be a hurt and pop. If you are going to short a biotech, then short something like Gilead, something more efficient, some something more established. It's like we're almost going for just the opposite that we would go for on the long side. On the long side, we want to find some sort of inefficiency in the stocks, some stock that is poised to have some big move higher. Okay. But on the short side, it's, you're almost better off with a stock that's more efficient. Now, Paul, uh, I'm sorry, not Paul, Phil. My eyes are, are <laughs> I got to learn. You know, it's funny. It's like, well, I'm on my to-do list. I need to figure out how to make bigger fonts on everything I'm using. It's like somebody said, your eyes going bad? No, my eyes aren't going bad, but everybody's using smaller fonts nowadays. What's up with that? So I uh, was at a, <laughs> was at a, <laughs> I was at a school function a while back for my daughter, and um, I was typing. I was I was texting a friend. There was like three or four of the the mothers around me. They were all laughing because they could read my text because I've got the I've got the big font on my phone. <laughs> yeah, I can get about three or four letters across the screen, but I digress. But anyway, Phil says this is not uh, analyst, but two thousand nine hundred and thirty-two funds own Jillian. Okay, so. What does that mean? Well, it means that, number one, how many funds are left to buy it? And number two, if the stock does begin to drop and those 3,000 funds round numbers need to raise capital for whatever reason, let's say people start selling their fund, okay? Uh, people's uh, individuals' timing isn't always the best in the world. It's not doesn't necessarily use technical analysis. But let's say that fund starts going down, then people will start selling that fund or might start selling that fund. If they're smart, they will. And I had a friend that was running a lot of money, and he used to buy and uh, he used to buy mutual funds for his fund, and then he would sell the mutual funds when things started going bad, and, and the people would get mad at him for selling it. He would explain to them, you know, I'm doing you a favor. I'm selling your fund because it's going down. You probably should raise some cash and, and, and get out of these stocks because the stock market's going down. But I digress. But anyway, so that's 3,000 funds out there with the potential to sell it. That's 3,000 potential sellers of this stock should it not work out. So that's one gauge of efficiency. I don't want to spend too much more time on efficiency. We spend, oh, I don't know, probably two hours on efficiency in the um, stock selection course alone. But a very important thing for you to understand is efficiency. So, yeah, it is a fairly efficient stock. I, I, I hear you. As far as the setup is concerned, I just don't like, again, the wide loose action and this little dip in here. And you are, at this particular juncture, fighting the overall trend in the uh, in biotechs, okay? Which is not always a bad thing. Not, again, not talking out of both sides of my mouth. If you get it right, then you're a little early to the party, and then you have a potential to really uh, do well. Uh, Harry, we'll get to that one when we go. I hope, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. When we get to the charts, I'll, I'll be happy to pull that one up for you, okay? I see Jillian in this chart is going sideways since late August, basically trading at a range like a, like the sector. The first thrust is not really a first thrust, but a drop to the bottom of the range, and a pullback merely a move up towards the, the range. Uh, I, I, I do hear you to some extent. I think you're. I think we're 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 reaching the same point uh, by two different means. Uh, that he's saying he sees it more of a range, and that's a good way of looking at it. I agree with that. I can't argue with that. Um, so, yeah, you can see that it's a little bit more rage bound, but when it starts breaking down out of this range, then that might be the mother ball setup. So maybe around 90, if you're willing to forego that first little move out, and then maybe if it gets a setup around 95 or so, you might have the mother of all setups there. Only 56 funds own UEC, okay, plus us. 
just for fun, 4,666 on Apple. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. So Apple better keep on being Apple, keep on doing what it's doing, because as soon as it does it, it could, um, it could implode quickly. Okay, uh, let's wrap up the slides. Let's take a look at the market, and then let's open it up for your um, individual stock uh, questions. Um, 2014 volume one of these shows if you like these shows I have them on flash drives and um, they've, they've been really a, a hot seller and people really I've never had one complaint I've never I shouldn't jinx myself but I've never had one returned um, and it's a lot of information and given the price I think it's a, just a, really a bargain uh, this is what we covered up until uh, June of the year but I'll make you a deal um, if you get the if volume one, I'll give you volume two of the year two. And so that's everything we covered for the entire year. And then you can go back on my website to get uh, prior years. I also have, I think it's 2011 available. If you don't have that one, let me know. I don't have it on the website, but somebody uh, requested it, so I put it together for them. Uh, so we've got about uh, four or five years of these uh, presentations. And it's a lot of information. Like today, we covered volatility, and that's a pretty good um, – I think that was a pretty good lesson to say some of the stuff. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stocks. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and cover uh, two things. One, I want to cover the overall market first. And then um, I want to cover the questions that deal with uh, trading in general versus the individual stocks. Um, right now, I'm still running a special. I don't know how long I'm going to run it, at least until the end of the year. If you get the stock selection course, you get one year free to the trading service, Okay. So if you bought those separately, you're looking at uh, $3,000 round number, but it's going to be less than half of that. If you just get the stock selection course, you're going to get a trading service. Uh, by the way, the IPO course, I still have one session left on that to do out of the four sessions. And one thing I was doing is I was letting a couple of these positions run, and I was letting a couple of new positions trigger and run. So we'd have some uh, really good stuff to talk about. So that's in case you're wondering why I haven't uh, did, done that follow-up webinar. That in addition to some other things um, going on. But that was that's the main reason is I want to let a few of these things run. So if you still get the you still still time to get into that last session if you want to uh, uh, see a live session there uh, with the IPO. So just uh, check out my website for that. And then I'll probably make an announcement within a week. We'll probably have one in about uh, two weeks to follow up a uh, last session. Uh, a couple of things, uh, $47 intro rate for my uh, service, and then you can get uh, 10 years archives. You can download those off my website, so check that out if you get a chance. All right, um, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's work our way into the um, sectors and then down into the individual stocks, okay? And we got plenty of time this week, so we should be able to get to everybody's questions. Uh, before we get into all that, a lot of, uh, the question was on UEC and overhead resistance. Uh, the volatility of UEC is such that it could just take off in here. And I liked it shorter term. Longer term, I agree. It's kind of electrocardiogram. Sometimes I will give a stock, because this is just a beautiful pattern here. Stock took off, pulled back. And now it's rallying out of that pullback. And it's still time. I don't want to talk about position or pump and dump, but I, I, you know, it, I'm not a pump and dump because I hold this stock for years as long as the booze is my favorite. But I still think there's time to get in on this one. Now, this overhead supply really isn't, if you look at where the entry is, it's actually above the overhead supply. So I wasn't too, too worried about this supply here because the entry is close enough to the top of that. But, yeah, longer term, it does have some overhead supply here and there, but it's super volatile. And so I think the volatility of it trumps that. And the fact that it's coming off of these major lows with so much vigor, I think it's on its way to, uh, to double or triple. But we'll see, okay? We're going to see some new model portfolio results. You can download all of the, if you're, um, if you're behind the, find, if you are on the trial uh, rate, you can see everything. You can see all of uh the recent spreadsheets, and then you can go even further back. Uh, if you're not on a trial, you can still download 10 years of um, stuff. It's on my website. Go to the store, and then uh, once you get to the store, go over to Trading Service, and it should be there. Store, 
right there and then daily trading service right here and then if you look on this page there's going to be uh, the archives there's going to be a link on this page somewhere to all the archives okay right here last 10 years right there if you want to see everything and I do have a YouTube video out there now, the YouTube video is based on using a little discretion but discretion isn't something elusive discretion is something is something that I teach like I'll say this stock is very close to the stop let's give it a little bit of room as opposed to using that stop mechanically and if it just kind of barely nicks the stop we'll stay with the position okay so if you look on YouTube I have the discretionary portfolio out there for the last 10 years I think I haven't updated it for 2014 yet but it's on my to-do list okay let's take a look at uh, so the UEC I don't see a whole lot of overhead resistance because our entry is right above it or right at it uh, so I'm not too worried about that uh, this is the actual portfolio, in case you're wondering. This is a short, this rad, uh, kite is a long, and CTLT is also a long, uh, in case you're wondering. That's the current model portfolio. Now, let's take a look at the overall market here. And we kind of already talked about the P's. And again, the P's are just kind of drifting in here. I'm not a big fan of the pattern. I'd prefer to see it accelerate one way or the other. Obviously, I want to see them go up and not look back. But you can see we have an okay day here. It looks like the opening gap reversal or the initial uh, weakness of the market was uh, overcome. There's the spiders, you can see. So it gapped a little lower, but then came back up. So, so far, so good. But just kind of meandering in here, and the volatility is staying uh, very low. And let's see where it is. If the market closed where it is today, the volatility, as you can see down here, is still going to be extremely low. So I would continue to brace for a big move. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a fake out if it does go higher. But ideally, if I had if I had my rathers, like the girl, my little country girl I used to date, uh, I guess she'd rather someone else than me, <laughs> obviously. Uh, I'd rather it just bang out, you know, bang down like it's going to implode. And that would shake out the nervous delis, maybe some uh, attract some eager shorts, some top pickers, and then turn around and go right back up. And that would just play beautifully into this low volatility situation I've been talking about. Unfortunately, like I wrote in the column this morning, they, not, they are not going to make it easy on us. Rarely, just, rarely do things unfold in a perfect manner. But if it did, that would just be sweet, especially with these, these biases coming up. Not a big fan of the biases, but if everything works out, the bias comes in on top of it, then bam, it's like off to the races, and it can work, work out very nicely. All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Uh, P's, again, I don't like the loss of momentum. I think it's kind of dangerous to start buying in here. Ideally, I like to see a knockout move first, but one day at a time, one setup at a time. You notice that we did have some stocks in the portfolio. That's because they were setting up, and I like the setups, and it's like, well, you know, like we got a candidate in Louisiana right now. He's like uh, – I know you don't like me, but close your eyes and vote for me. So it's kind of like if you like the setup, but you don't like the actual overall market, you kind of you sort of have to close your eyes and buy the setup. I mean, that's what if you really like the setup and think it has potential. All right, uh, Nasdaq uh, opening gap reversal there, opening lap reversal depends on how you want to look at it. I, I'm wondering, are we getting a true open here in the uh, Intelli chart today? I thought we opened a little bit lower than this, but anyway, you could see that. Volatility has uh, waned here too, has dropped down very low, and it's just kind of a drift mode in here. Um, in markets, again, I don't like this. I call it a wedge, for lack of a better word, where they just kind of wedge higher in here. I like to see them accelerate higher and not look back. One thing interesting in the Rusty is now the Rusty's got some issues of its own. If you back the chart out, it's not all the way back to its old highs and all. But if you just looked at a shorter term, it is kind of interesting that it did come down. And this my volatility by accident, I put the volatility indicator with my bow ties, but just hanging with me in this. But you can see that the volatility uh, got really low and the Russell. And the first move out, the expansion move was down. So what do you look to do? You look to buy. Well, that just kind of dovetails in with a pullback into Russell. So the Russell might unfold exactly as um, as advertised with the volatility situation. Uh, ideally, I like to see the Russell at new highs with everything else, but that's going to take a little bit of doing, at least so far. Now let's take a look at um, 
couple little areas in here, and then we'll, I promise you, we'll jump into those stocks, and we're going to have plenty enough time to get to everybody's stocks today. Um, for the most part, most areas are looking pretty good here. Uh, computer hardware, or as I like to call it, Apple, uh, continues to remain at or near new highs. Software has been doing pretty good, too, as far as that's concerned. Let's see what else is going on here. Let's see if we can find it. Here we go, software. You can see we got a little bit of a pullback in here, but so far, not too bad. So far, so good in software. Most areas have done fairly well. It's kind of interesting, though, if you get like to the... The regional banks, they sort of took off in here, but did that, now they're coming right back in. This is why we wait for follow-through and pullbacks. This is another example of the regionals. They've come right back in. For the most part, though, most areas are doing pretty good. Uh, metals and mining turned back down yesterday. They're kind of bouncing around a little bit. I wouldn't bottom fish in here. Again, if you back this chart way out, uh, you could argue that, well, you could have bottom fished here, and I would drop below that. Uh, gold itself, and especially silver, Makes a great example why you don't bottom fish. It looked pretty low right here, didn't it? Okay? And then it continued to drop, and then it imploded much, much further. So that's why you don't bottom fish. you got to be careful in doing that. Okay? Now, if you think silver at 18 bucks is a good deal, and you're going to hold on to it forever, then that's fine. But that's not a trade. That's not. We're here to learn how to trade. We're not here to learn how to be uh, hoarders or value investors. Somebody gave me a silver coin for my birthday. I thought that was pretty cool. An ounce of silver. I was, I was like, oh, I like that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> you can stay. Uh, Simbies coming back in here today. I was a little concerned about them because they were stalling short of their prior highs in here. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, I'll give you my address if you want to send me an ounce of silver. That's, that's fine. You can send me more than an ounce if you want. Uh, nice little breakout of this little tiny range in here. I was a little concerned because it was stalling short of that prior highs, kind of making this uh, deep retrace stalling out. But so far, so good. But I feel a lot better once they took out the prior peaks in here. Um, I like to see the semis join in with the overall market. I say that's old school. I guess if I was old school, I'd want to see the transports joining in too. But I, I do like the semis to follow the indices and at least uh, confirm what you're seeing in the indices. And I prefer, I much prefer, if the Civics will have at brand new highs like the overall market itself, based on the P's and NASDAQ, at least. Uh, NASDAQ 14-year highs, obviously. Uh, health Services banged down new highs recently. Let's take a look at drugs. Drugs banged down new highs recently. Um, within drugs, biotech, not doing as well, but biotech's a little bit higher beta. When it comes back, it can come back with a vengeance. But it has been consolidating a little bit in here. We're along a couple of biotechs, as you know. So ideally, I want to see this biotech bust out and not look back for a while. Certain areas within drugs like delivery have been doing really well in here, and you can see the delivery is also banging out new highs. For the most part, most areas are doing fairly well. A couple areas like hospitals stinking up the joint, but I wouldn't get too excited about that just because there are uh, a couple, one or two areas aren't or underperforming in here. As far as gold and silver is concerned, before I forget, uh, we just I just give you a big just gave you a big lesson on bottom fishing. I would not bottom fish those areas unless you really, really like the setup, of course. If you do have a legitimate setup, then by all means, go for it. Uh, but you can see that we don't really have, to me, so far, this looks like trend continuation versus a first thrust, okay? Now, check back often because, uh, like, silver is actually looking a little bit better. You can see silver is kind of a, it's on the cusp. It's, it's either like a witch hat for a new leg down or it's trying to make that first thrust up. I haven't made my determination just yet. For now, I think you probably want to err on the side of the longer term trend, but check back often. And if we start seeing setups here, then we will start taking setups within those areas. But for now, gold is just kind of, and silver is just kind of, it looks like they're still kind of headed lower in here, okay? John says, uh, let's go ahead and open up the individual stocks. Kite is along, absolutely, absolutely. Kite is the best stock in, 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 in Stocktown. Yeah, you want to buy as much as you can afford and then buy some. Borrow some money. Mortgage your house. <laughs> we are long kite, FYI, in case you can't tell. Yeah, kite looks pretty good. Uh, you know, nice little pullbacks, rallied out of the pullback. So far, so good. Maybe a second entry above this peak here. Um, I like it because it's an IPO, a relatively new issue. Uh, it's been trending nicely higher. It's not perfect, but with IPOs, I do give them a little bit of a pass. 
Uh, not enough time to get into that in a lot of detail today. That's that's all in the course. But yeah, absolutely, kite looks good. It's still a relatively new issue. If you are hesitant on the overall market but are getting setups that trigger, how do you think about your overall portfolio positioning? Do you have a view that you are willing to be 50% long and will take setups until it up until you're that long? Seems like it would be easy to end up 100% long by taking setups if you don't feel completely comfortable with the broader market. Well, what happens is today's a great example. I, I hear you, and, and I guess technically that could happen. Uh, but a couple things, if I'm a little hesitant about the overall market, a little nervous about the overall market, like right now we're just kind of drifting in here, I know the bias is generally to the upside, I know it's probably going to all work out, but I am a little nervous uh, about the overall market. So two things, I'm going to be selective in my setups, and I'm also going to look for stocks that I think can trade contra to the overall market, and that means more speculative issues like, an IPO or a biotech or a biotech IPO, uh huh, right? Or some commodity related stock like uranium and or again a speculative stock or a speculative uranium stock. Well all of uranium stocks are speculative, so I guess I could throw that out the window as a redundant statement. So that's the first thing. So first thing is super duper selective. And if you're super duper selective, you're gonna have days like today on the trading service, I didn't recommend any setups for today, any new setups, okay? So there is still a bit of that wait and see mode in there, but I hear you. You could eventually end up with a full portfolio, but hopefully before that happens, the market's going to tip its hand, make its move, and you won't end up too lopsided. we got one left over short, and now we have three longs in the portfolio. Ideally, I want to see those longs hit the initial profit target as soon as possible, so we're just giving up open profits on the second half of the position. And that, I'm okay with that. And hopefully by staying selective, we won't get too many new positions until the market can be a little bit more decisive in its direction. Okay. But, yeah, there's always a problem that you're going to end up on the wrong side of the market. The good news is the database will help to keep you on the right side of the market. Uh, recently, all I saw was some shorts, and the market sold off 8%. Now these shorts didn't pan out as well, pan out as well as I hoped they would. I hope they all would turn into big winners, right? We only had one that turned into a decent winner, but that's what the database was offering, okay? And that's what you take. And as a general statement, longer term, you listen to that database, and you're going to be the right side of the market. Now one more point, and then we'll hop into individual stocks. I promise. The other thing too is if you're trading a, a pullback methodology, and if the market is drifting higher like it has been lately, you're not going to see too many pullbacks unless you get a rolling correction within the market. So as a general statement, you're not going to have a whole lot of setups. And then here's the other thing, too, you got to realize. We've got three longs right now. Now, if those longs don't become very profitable very soon, then I'm going to become even more picky on my next longs, okay? So that's the other thing you do, and that's the ebb and flow speech that I give quite often. Watch the archives to all of these shows, and you'll see that. Is that if you are long, and let's say you're somewhat heavily long, let's say you got three longs in a portfolio, and they're not super profitable, and you're not taking profits on those, or they're not the initial profit target, then before you take that fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth position on the long side, Make sure you really, really like those additional positions. So in theory, yeah, you could end up 100% long and 100% wrong. There's always a chance. You know, nobody's going to get a lot got alive, right? You're not going to avoid losses altogether. But there is a good chance that you will be on the right side of the market if you listen carefully to what the database is telling you. All right, now let's open them up for questions. All right, just randomly LL. For Don, hello. No, no. <laughs> Let me see if I could find it. I said last week I would I would have it ready for this week, but I don't. Dang. I got a um. I downloaded a video of electrocardiogram. Let me just give him electrocard. 
let me get Nicholas ready too, because I see Don's got a lot of questions. So let's bring up Nicholas. No, it's Nicholas Feinstein from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Don, that big gap we talked about last week, it's still there. <laughs> so uh, anybody who owned this stock and got caught up in this this uh, debacle here is going to look to exit the stock as it tries to push into the gap. So avoid that like the plague. Don's still here, and Don wants to know about Ford. That's hard to believe. Um, well, we had the nice little sell-off out of the bow tie. It imploded. It's just all over the place. Uh, it imploded, and now it's trying to come back up. Um, I think it, it kind of gets an electric cardiogram award, too, now. So I don't really see where it could... Um... Oh, it's eBay. All right. Didn't work. Okay. XXIA for Greg. XXIA. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got going on here. Yeah, it's coming off its lows. It's pulling back a little bit. Looks like it's bottoming out. I hear you. Uh, also a bow tie. Uh, it's not bad. It's got a little bit, uh, or a lot of bit, I should say. I probably would pass based on the amount of overhead supply uh, up around 12, which is only about 20% above where it is now. So I would pass based on that, but I hear you. If you wanted to take a swing trade up to up to 12, Heck, that'd be a good problem to have, you know. Why not? Zoma? No. This is just, this is, looks like I got an arrow drawn in from last time. Let it break out above the top of this range, okay? See if it can do that. It try to get out? Nope. Try to get out? Nope. Try to get out? Nope. Okay? It wants it, you know, why try to anticipate that it's going to break out of that range? Let it prove itself by breaking out of it. So maybe after it breaks out on a pullback, but... Just longer term, the history of this one doesn't really excite me that much. It's kind of all over the place. CDK for James. CDK. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This was on one of my IPO watch lists. Um, it made a new high here. And as we talked about, there is a breakout characteristic of IPOs. So that would have been a potential buy there and a breakout. Uh, but more importantly, you had a nice trend here and a nice little pullback. So James gets a high five today. James is one of my clients. He's a smart guy. Heather wants to know about LOGM. LOGM. Uh, let's see. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, the problem is it never really got past this prior little peak in here. And if you back the chart out a little bit, it's a little wide and loose. I mean, I hear you. It's up towards new highs. It's pull, It has pulled back. So it's not a bad stock. It probably wouldn't hurt to put this on your watch list, or momentum list. But as far as a, a possible setup, I don't like the way it pulled back to its prior little peaks in here. Uh, if you look harder, you might be able to find something that trades a little bit cleaner than that. I mean, like that CDK example, I think that was James that brought that up. Um, you know, this this trades cleanly. No, notice it tends to go up day after day after day after day. And then it looks like it's having a nice little orderly pullback in here, okay? So, yeah, try to find something a little bit more like that. Pacey, P-A-Y-C for John. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Uh, a little bit on the thin side, but you can trade it as an individual trader. It's a relatively new issue, so I call that a toddler. And toddlers can uh, make nice moves. So, yeah, on a pullback. It's certainly trending. It needs to be, if it's not already in your momentum watch list, put it, make, it make a watch list and put it in there. Win for HRTG. HRTG. Not when, W-H-E-N, but W when, HRTG. Uh, it pulled back a little bit too far to its prior little base in here. I mean, I hear you. It's a relatively new issue. Uh, really thin, though. Uh, now, doesn't mean you can't trade these little IPOs that are thin as a private trader, but just know the, know the beast going in. Know that it's going to be a little dangerous. And I'm more inclined to trade a thin the IPO way back here as opposed to trading it now that it becomes a toddler. Because once it becomes more established, I do like to see more and more volume coming into them. So volume is still pretty low on this one. Uh, it pulled back a little bit too much. I think I'd leave it alone. Also, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got 10 days in the pullback. Usually you want to see something uh, pull back a few days and then take off. About 10 days is usually the cutoff on that. HTTG also for win. HTTG. 
Oh, no, no, that was HRTG. No problem. Okay. Uh, John wants to know about CDK. Absolutely. We just talked about that one. Fantastic. ACHN. ACHN. Um, this is a biotech. It never really did clear its prior little peak in here. That's my only uh, concern. I mean, I hear you. It's broken out and pulled back. It looks okay. I would pass because it didn't clear the prior peak. I'd like to see it break out to new highs. Let's say get about 15 or so, and then maybe on a pullback. Uh, John, I like that one. I think that one's on the watch list for today, though. Let me, um, I'm going to go, I'm not going to opine on that one. Uh, in case you're asking about one, the, the stock that begins with Q. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that one because it is on the watch list. Uh, good eye, though, on that one. DTSI, also for John, DTSI. But, hey, high five on that one. Uh, this looks pretty good. Pullback's a little shallow, uh, but it's certainly not bad. I can't really argue with this. Volume's a little bit on the thin side, but it's not bad. It's it's not bad at all. Uh, you do have persistency, and then it began to accelerate higher and pull back. I'm going to give you okay on that one. It's not jumping out at me, though. i got to figure out why. But... I can't argue with it. I mean, it's got it's got all the makings of a good setup. It's cleared this overhead supply from way back here. It's persisted in its trend. Uh, you know, this is one where if I had to say up or down, I would definitely say up. ACHN for Mr. Don. ACHN. No, we talked about this. Then we pull back. It pull back below its prior breakouts. Okay, so it would have to get above 15 or so. Uh, XNPT for James. XNPT. Uh, not bad. I like a little bit more pullback, but not bad at all. Yeah, that one looks pretty interesting in here. Maybe you want a little bit more pullback. Okay. Heather wants to know about FFIV. At first, I thought she was giving me a high five. I'll take it. Uh, the only thing I don't like about this one, Heather, is it, it, it just kind of got to its prior peak in here, given the uh, appearance of a bit of a double top. Um, so for me to get excited about it, it would have to blast past these highs and then pull back. So I think uh, I would pass on that. PG for Dr. Lee. PG, I'm not gonna, probably not going to be a big fan of it, but I know that these uh, non-durables have been rallying as of late. The uh, reason I'm not a big fan of non-durables is because look at the HV. you got an HV of 12. Uh, which is very low, and but I hear you, Doctor Lee. It looks good. I mean, I like the I like the thrust higher. I like the little pullback. So I can't fault you on the setup, other than it is lower in volatility. Uh, it is higher in volume, so it's a more efficient type of stock. It doesn't move around that much. I mean, the move from here to here is four points. We just looked at some little gold stocks that moved 26 percent in one day. Uranium stocks, similar type of moves. But I hear you, it's not a bad looking stock. The only problem is anytime you I would call this a low beta stock and Procter and Gamble or any type of these these big conglomerate stocks are going to trade as a general statement in tandem with the overall market. So in a lot of cases you're just sort of buying the overall market when you're buying like a P and G or a stock like this. But I, I can't argue with the setup. The setup is there. HV is too low for me. Okay. King of Lows on a pullback. Okay, King, Karen G. Eat like a king. Here, King, here, King. Uh, well, you got this big gap here. It's worked its way through it. Now you got a little overhead resistance to deal with. You know what? I think I would just wait for it to get to new highs. It's a relatively new issue. Uh, I hate when new issues have problems this early on. New issues are brought public because they're going to cure some sort of problem or they're going to make good burritos or they're going to make comfortable exercise clothes for people like me who eat too many burritos, okay, and need to exercise. Uh, they shouldn't fail coming out of the gate like this or early in the process. So I would pass on this one until it could get, until it could make all-time highs, in fact, okay. Great point. Thank you, John. FCAU. How would you say that? Fuck, 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 fuck. I'm going to get in trouble here. <laughs> uh, Fiat Chrysler. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is one uh, This is one I'm going to actually show in the next uh, IPO webinar because you had 
believe it or not, you had a bit of a breakout. It was a stealthy breakout, but that's what we taught. You had a stealthy breakout right here. That would have actually been a buy on this particular day here, believe it or not. Um, I don't think it's a buy right now. You do have a little gap, but it is a it can be a foreign stock or it is a foreign stock. So let's uh, let's just wait and see. Um, it would have to make new highs and then pull back again. But yeah, that was definitely a breakout buy a while back. I think if all you did was was play those breakout buys and IPOs, uh, you might not trade every day. But I think you would do very well. Uh, obviously, the market like 2008, there wouldn't be any IPOs because nobody would be stupid enough to bring their company public. You wouldn't get any trades. But, hey, that's okay. You'd beat 95% of all money managers just by sitting on your hands. Okay. SM, SEMG has rebounded strongly from 65 back to current price. It is currently inching higher. It is better to buy before it moves too much, up too much. Well, let's take a look at the stock first. No, uh, no, it's not a setup, John. Uh, there's no setup here, okay? It's just kind of, for, and here's the thing. If you're trading my methodology, this stock you would have to make new highs. I don't like trading stocks when they're in with a range like this, okay? So it would have to make new highs. Now, if you only had a few days in here, it would be a short, okay? Let me, so I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth so you understand what I'm saying. Uh, it was a short back here, but it never really triggered or materialized because, you see, it rolled over sharply from its highs. But I don't like to play that mid-range bounce in here. If you are going to play a bounce, play a bounce uh, or a transition emerging trend pattern. Pay those, play those off of major, major lows like the gold stocks right now or, more importantly, the silver, like the silver stocks, okay? Okay. Um, I had initially had SLW on my list for today, and then I took it off. I, I didn't like it at the last minute. It was kind of just picking it apart. But you'd be much better off playing a stock that's way down here at multi-year lows, uh, not quite all-time lows, but like five-year lows or ten-year lows, as opposed to playing the middle of the range type of stock. And it just got too much wide and loose trade, and that's why I took it off the list. But So not a perfect example of where you want to look to play a transition, but it kind of gives you an idea. Uh, John, that one's actually on my watch list for today, so I'm, um, I, I agree with you, so we're not going to talk about it. FLT for Heather. FLT. Um, it's another one of those cases where, okay, it's breaking out, but it's got to keep breaking out. Remember, except for a few exceptions with IPOs, we are not breakout traders. We're pullback traders, okay? So if it keeps breaking out on a pullback, absolutely. So put this one on your watch list. This is a, this is the kind of stock that might make it to the Landry 100, uh, my momentum list. Okay. You ever trade ranges? Do you ever trade ranges or always pullbacks in a trend? I always trade pullbacks in a trend. I, I'm doing. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed or not. Some of you have. Uh, I've been doing a, a guest hosting spot uh, spot lately for TimingResearch.com, and um, the, this week's question, which obviously I might, if you if you to came to the show, you probably figured that I, I was had a hand in help, helping select the question, was whether you should trade uh, multiple methodologies or one single methodology. And if you want to watch the show, it is on, um, go to my YouTube page and go to likes. Let me just show you real quick to save, save a few emails after the show. Uh, if you go to my YouTube page, just you come here, it says links. And if you look at these links, one of them is going to say YouTube channel right here. If you go to that YouTube channel and you look at my likes, it's in the likes. In fact, let me see if we can do this here. I don't know if it's going to have anything. There's my channel. And then down here, you're going to see the likes. Okay, timing research. So this is the last couple of shows I have posted down here. Got a cool little intro in there. <laughs> anyway, check out the channel. I'm I'm pretty proud of this channel, as you can tell, and I've got some great stuff. So uh, subscribe to that channel. It, it, it you don't get emails or anything from it. it's nothing like that. You just uh, when you get there, you'll get notices on on new videos and stuff. Um, I just built a studio in my office, so we're going to be doing some really cool videos soon. I've got a lot of great stuff planned. I'm pretty excited about it uh, later this year and early next year. 
What's the difference between – how do you tell the difference between trade continuation and a first thrust, okay, and gold? That's a tough question. I get more questions on the transitional setups than anything else, and the answer is there is no sure answer. Uh, and if you go in and watch the flash drive, sometimes we'll cover this too. It's either going to be a pullback, a deep pullback, or an obvious transition, okay? or deep pullback or inflection point. So this is, becomes a question mark. This is obviously a pullback. This is obviously a possible emerging trend or first thrust. If you have a deep pullback, it's a question mark because it can go higher or it can go lower. Now you're talking about bottom fishing. Well, okay, you got this, you got that, and then you got this. So this is going to be more of a question mark and then something that's a very sharp, sharp, sharp retracement higher. Okay. So you don't know, but what you do is you wait for, you, you do a couple things. You say, okay, well, I think this market looks like it's turned around. I got a little setup here. I got a little bow tie or something. Wait for that bow tie. I'll wait for that obvious first thrust and then make sure you don't have any overhead supply to deal with and then take the trade. Okay. Just know that you're going to be a pioneer. And the fact that it's not always cut and dry helps to make it work. That's kind of like the, the stuff that makes it not work is the same stuff that makes it work. Hopefully that makes sense because if it is a continuation of the longer, if it, let's say it's not a continuation of the longer term trend, those who thought it was are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market. Okay, But obviously you want it to be as well defined as possible, no overhead supply, and Ideally, maybe a bow tie or something like that that has to, to confirm. The only problem with waiting for bow ties is you might be a little late to the party or maybe too late to the party if it is a sharp, sharp reversal, okay? Oh, did, I didn't answer the prior question. I'm sorry. Do you ever take trade, trade ranges or always pullbacks to the trend? I always trade pullbacks to the trend. I think if you're going to be a trader, I think the best thing you could do is to pick one methodology and stick to that one methodology. I got sidetracked on my YouTube channel. Sorry about that. Do one thing. Do one thing well. It's kind of like the little line in City Slickers where, you know, the the he's asking Curly, the the rancher or whatever, uh, Billy Crystal's character is asking the rancher. He's like, uh, what's the, he says, you want to know the secret of life? And well, Curly says, you the secret of life. And he holds up his finger and he says, you know, your finger. And he's like, no. Do one thing, and but just do one thing, whereas we get caught up in our careers and our lives and we try to do too many things. Just do one thing and do one thing well, and that works for the markets as well as life, but it works very well in the markets. You're better off just trading pullbacks within a trend, if that's your forte, which has become my forte, as opposed to trying to be a breakout trader when the market's breaking out, trying to be a reversal trader when the market's reversing and trying to be a reversion to the mean trader when the market is reverting to the mean. That sounds pretty good on paper. And it's kind of like it's kind of like one of those no you don't Danny situations. I know I've known some traders that it seems like we call them up they're always if the market's reversing, oh yeah, we caught this bottom this morning. Oh really? Well, if the trend would have continued and you call them up, oh yeah, we're just riding this trend continuation out, you know. No matter what's happening, they always seem to be on the right side of the market. And to that I say bullshit, okay, <laughs> to be frank, okay. Uh, it's, I think if you try to trade all these different methodologies, if you try to trade by different methodologies, I mean a reversion to the mean methodology, a breakout methodology, a pullback methodology, if you try to do all these things in a reversal methodology, I think you're going to end up chasing your own tail because right around the time the market looks to be reversing, by the time you get in, it's going to be too late, and then the market will be trending again. And by the time you get into a trending system, then it's going to be reverse you again. And, and I've seen a lot of people try to do it all, and it makes for a very um, interesting but short career. Uh, it, it'll, it will make you crazy after a while. You're better off doing one thing and doing it well, knowing that there will be times where there's nothing to do. You might have to just sit on your hands for a little while. So, yeah, uh, no. To answer your question, no. I just trade pullbacks for the most part. Yeah, thank you, Leon. Leon says, thanks, Dave. Great advice. One strategy, do it well. Exactly. We've got one person listening. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> I think breakout and pullbacks are interlinked. Well, not exactly. Do you trade leverage ETFs? Why or why not? Tracking errors. 
is why not. Efficiency and tracking errors. Not enough time to get into it today. We've talked about it many times in these presentations, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel on that. Um, if we have time next week or whenever, we could do it. It seems that your methodology pace counter trend move does not necessarily help to tell what's going to happen next. It seems that with your methodology, pace of counter trend move does not necessarily help to tell what is going to happen next. I'm not sure what that means. Pace of counter trend move. Um, if you get a deep pullback, then if it doesn't trigger, there's no harm done. Nobody's hurt. Okay. Uh, so I don't know what you're saying about the pace of the counter trend move. You got a deep pullback. Let's say you got a trigger up here, and then deep pullback becomes a reversal of trend. You never get triggered, okay? But sometimes if you do get triggered, the reversion to the mean move, okay? This market is so oversold that'll snap right back, and then you get a nice little initial profit target. So let me know if I'm answering your question properly. Okay, let's get some new ones in here. Okay, Harry left. I'm sorry about that. I was going to try to get to you before you left. Um, if I had your email, I'd email you a recording. Okay, uh, he wanted to know about Bitter. Uh, would Bitter have been a good short candidate about three weeks earlier? Yeah, I guess like in here, um, it didn't really come and fall out of bed, but I guess that's a pretty big um, slide. But it didn't really trigger either. So yeah, the question is, would that be a short candidate? Uh, yeah, it didn't really come out of fall out of bed, but up or down, I would say down at this juncture. In perfect hindsight, I know it didn't go down, but I would also use a liberal entry. And you could see through a liberal entry, you would not have gotten triggered on a short, and then it just kind of went back up. So hopefully that answers that question. It is probably the market will correct in that context. What do you do with your long set of triggers now that you are now worrying about the market to pull it back? Your views appreciated. Well, I don't have, I don't personally have any new long side setups today, but check back tomorrow. Check back tonight after I do my analysis. Maybe I will. Um, well, I'm going to wait for entries, and hopefully that pullback will happen before I get triggered in. And hopefully that pullback doesn't hurt my existing longs too much because the beta is high enough. Or the speculation, it's they're speculative enough to be able to avoid a pullback. And maybe because like one's uranium, maybe it could avoid a pullback of the overall market too. Okay. So yeah, I mean that's the tough part. This is these are not easy markets when it's just kind of drifting higher like this. If it's nineteen ninety nine and just going straight up day after day after day, it's a no brainer. Okay. Two thousand eight, where it's generally just going down, it's a no brainer. But right now, eh, I don't know. It's a little tough in here. And there is no right answer, okay? HRTG, must the volume yesterday. I don't use volume. HRTG, yeah, I don't use volume, so good for it. <laughs> DTSI and a pullback. DTSI. Uh, yeah, we talk about this one. That's yeah, okay. LOGM, possible long position starts to move up 50, 70. LOGM. Uh, no, it pulled back to its prior breakout in here, so I don't like it. SanDisk, S and D K. Uh, no, no. See, this is a high-level transition. I don't like high-level transitions. So, somebody said, just said, you trade within the ranges. No, now that you got this big, wide, and loose range in here, this stock's going to have to trade off to new highs before I even consider it as a long anymore. Okay, cyber. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. It needs to pull back a little bit, though. Okay, uh, it either either needs to pull back or break out to new highs and then pull back. But yeah, put that on your watch list. Little on the thin side, still an IPO. We're gonna give it a pass for being thin. INCR. INCR. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Well, the only problem is, the only problem is it's only gone two points, okay? So that's not that impressive of a move. Um, but yeah, put it on your radar for an IPO to watch, absolutely. Pen, P-E-N-N, P-E-N-N, James. Well, I don't like the fact that it's got this prior peak in here. I prefer it to be up in clear air. 
Um, I know you're a pretty good stock picker, though, so there's something you're seeing there. Let's see what you're seeing. Yeah, he's seeing that it's accelerating higher and pull back. If I was just seeing this in and of itself, I'd say, yeah, go for it. It's a good-looking setup. But the fact that it's uh, below this prior peak and kind of wide and loose longer term, I think I would pass on that. Okay. Um, probably on the last one, ADPT. ADPT, maybe one more. Uh, yeah, the only thing I don't like about this one is it just had that one big up day, and that was kind of it, and then it just kind of drifted higher. And now it's retraced almost 100% of that. The other thing, too, is hospitals right now, uh, like I said earlier, they're kind of stinking up the joint. So even though it's a new issue, I'm going to have a hard time getting excited about a hospital. Okay. And last one up is DM. DM. Uh, it's not bad. Um, it's okay. You had a pretty good uh, you had a pretty good run here, but then it kind of went sideways, and now it's kind of drifting lower. You know what? I think it would have to break out the new highs and then pull back for me to get excited about it. Okay. All right. I guess we need to go ahead and wrap things up. We're right around the cusp of uh, where the recording gets a little tough to manage, so let's go ahead and do that. As you can tell, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them. Thanks so much for showing up. I see a lot of new faces today. Don't be afraid to ask questions. This is what, you know, you make the show. Without you, there is no show. So don't be, don't be ashamed or, or scared. There's no bad questions. There's no, uh, you know, now if you come in every week and, and you do stupid things, I'm going to beat you up, as you may have seen today with some of you guys. But uh, if you know better, you shouldn't do that. But if you just do, don't worry about asking about stocks. I'm not going to beat you up too much. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, everybody have a great, uh, that's right, no show next week, uh, Thanksgiving. Everybody have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Uh, for those of you in the States, uh, for those of you uh, outside of the States, happy Thursday. And um, thanks again for showing up, Boyd, and we'll see you uh, in two weeks. Thank you so much.